Hopefully would be a next step for us would be developing an animal model to carry on understanding more about these um, mutations that we have and understand better their roles in organisms as a whole and how they lead to our symptoms that we see in our patients. Fellow homo sapiens, in this week's Epilepsy Sparks Insights podcast, we have Valentina Galassi Devori, a final year PhD student at University College London, telling us all about her work researching the genetics underlying the epilepsies. Find out how clinical and functional aspects of genetic mutations can and have been discovered, specifically when it comes to the KCNA6 gene, and how cross-disciplinary collaborations can be of distinct benefit to epilepsy research. Hi, thank you so much, Tori, for having me. So I'm a final year um, PhD student um, funded by the BBSRC Lido program, and I'm based at the Institute of Neurology in Professor Henry Holden's lab with um, Professor Mark Caulfield and Dr. Rupi Manika as well, whose labs work on identifying new genes associated with disease, genetic and clinical analysis of whole genome sequencing, and also um, assessing functional consequences of mutations identified. Wow, that sounds amazing. And I feel like it needs to be a longer sentence (laughs) of everything that you just (laughs) said. I've also seen um, the lab referred to as the Neurogenetics Lab at Queen Square. Is that kind of a good summary as well of of what it is? Yes, that's a perfect summary for sure. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Looking at the genetics underlying neurological disorders. That's the perfect summary. <laughs> okay. I was fascinated by the fact that your work, your studies involve frog eggs. Tell us about your studies. <laughs> yes. So we've recently published um, a paper in the Epilepsia Journal uh, where we investigated clinical and functional aspects of new mutations that we discovered in this gene called KCNA6, which actually encodes for a protein called Voltage Gated Potassium Channel 1.6, which um, opens and closes based on changes in electrical voltages surrounding the neurons that we have in our um, bodies. And we've identified new variants in this gene, and we assessed the consequences of these mutations and what they actually change in um, channel property and behavior. And to do that, we've used frog eggs, which sounds a little bit wacky, but it's a, it's a very, very useful tool to have, definitely. How do you actually do it? Could you just give us a little picture in, in our heads of how you use frog eggs to do your research? Yeah, totally. So what we do is we have our um, genetic material in a test tube that then we inject into our frog eggs and we leave them for about 24 hours, 48 hours to express within our frog eggs, and then they're ready to go for experiments. So in a few days, you've got a batch of experiments up and running. And how do you do those experiments? We have this machine, and we essentially have two electrodes. We pop both of them into either side of this um, frog egg, and then we apply different voltages to open and close the channel to see whether there are any um, differences in our mutated channels compared to our wild type. Wow. Could you give us a summary of the actual results? So what did you learn? The mutant channels opened in a roughly similar manner to our normal channels, but following opening, it was more difficult for these channels to close. So they remained open for longer than our normal channels. So this means that these mutated channels are overactive, which is known as a gain of function mechanism. So it's predicted to alter the electrical properties of the neurons that express these channels. And this is possibly what could lead to the seizures. What are the, what's the likelihood that what you've discovered could lead to the seizures? It's, it's pretty likely. Um, what would always be best is not that much is known about this gene and this um, protein so far. What would be best and what hopefully would be a next step for us would be developing an animal model um, to carry on understanding more about these um, mutations that we have and understand better their roles in organisms as a whole and how they um, 
lead to our symptoms that we see in our patients. Yeah, I was just thinking, gosh, yes, uh, so frogs aren't, well, do they classify as animals as well as amphibians? Amphibians are a type of animal, aren't they? So I suppose you're referring to possibly mammals that is the next stage. Yeah, so mice models, for example, but also zebrafish models are pretty good as well. So it definitely would be next steps for us to explore. Could you explain to us what is the value of your research? So for instance, how many humans are identified as as having this gene mutation? At the moment, our cohort is at around four for this um, type of mechanism that we've discovered. Um, but what's really interesting and important about looking at mutations in these sorts of proteins is that one third of monogenic epilepsy. So what I mean by that is epilepsies caused by mutations in a single gene are caused by mutations in these types of proteins. So it's really important to kind of understand and grasp um, what these implications have of these mutations in these proteins, because it does um, lead to a fair proportion of epilepsies. Yes, yeah, so I think it's sort of really interesting here what you're saying or implying that is many genetic mutations, that what they, genetic mutations have different side effects on us to different people, right? And, um, and so some people could be diagnosed with a certain type of epilepsy, but other people may not because it doesn't affect them in the same way. Is that right? Yeah, I, I believe so. I think that's why like the more the more proteins and the more specific mutations that we analyze and we look at in a in a research environment, the more we'll be able to understand and answer these questions and help patients out and family members as well. Yeah, no, that's really good because we often, I think, look at a single gene mutation as solely affecting the person with that type of epilepsy or that type of disease relating to that certain mutation. But I think we're finding more and more that a person might have, um, say, I don't know, this, which one is it called? KCN, KCNA6. And um, yeah, so some people might experience different symptoms. Uh, they might have a different uh, mutation in addition, which may or may not be identified. We just know so little at the moment. Definitely, which is why our, our development of genetic sequencing as well definitely helps because now we have these tools right at our doorstep and it makes it a lot easier for us to answer these questions that until now have been really hard to answer. So I understand one of your colleagues or somebody else with at Queen Square has an additional exciting project that they're working on um, in regards to epilepsy research. Could you tell us about that, your, the person and what they're doing? Yeah, definitely. So um, a colleague of mine, um, postdoc research fellow uh, Stephanie, is actually um, involved in generating a mouse model um, to boost the research um, surrounding her gene of interest called NARS1. And um, they have got a publication out based on mutations in this gene. But since that first publication, their cohort, so the number of patients involved in this study has increased. They've got an additional 14 families um, with similar clinical phenotypes um, which include epilepsy, neuropathy, developmental delay, um, which is amazing. And the aim is to obviously increase the number of patients that they have in this group um, to be able to understand better, have more data. So they have a Facebook group and they have a website. She's doing some amazing work and in collaboration with other groups at UCL, we always love to expand our cohorts so yeah it's uh it's really really interesting stuff that the whole lab is doing lovely well i'll put links to stephanie's um study and her facebook group and website and everything and actually that's really it's great to hear that you know you, your studies might be different but you are working together um and inspiring one another i think that's really important it you know it reminds me of other you know, sort of industries where you're, well, fingers crossed, you might get on with some people at work, but you know, you're serving different people or you're 
reporting to different people and completing different tasks, but you get on and inspire each other. And I think that in, in my in my head, that sounds like it could be really valuable within the sphere of epilepsy research, um, the different inspirations, because you can get your head down all in, and become almost tunnel visioned in a positive way sometimes, I think, because you have to be focused. But to meet other people, other researchers could be of benefit. Definitely having cross-disciplinary uh, research, having people coming in and joining a project and joining a, um, a research group that comes from perhaps a different background um, works, works amazingly well because you have a refreshing mindset. Um, you have a different way of looking at things. So that definitely can help boost in terms of ideas, in terms of people's expertise that they have in different areas. And it's really, we're really starting to see that it's really becoming fundamental to research as a whole. Indeed. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Valentina. It's been lovely, inspiring, and it, it's, it's great to hear your open-mindedness and fresh outlook on things. I think that's really important in the sciences. So thank you so much. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you to Valentina today for sharing with us her exciting discovery regarding the KCN A6 gene, how the research must be continued and how it may benefit a broad spectrum of people affected by the epilepsies. Mm -hmm.